Hello everybody and welcome to a tier ranking of the Harry Potter movies. This is going to be different from my usual videos because it's going to be less edited and more sort of casual but I wanted to do an updated version of my movie rankings but didn't want to just do the same video again so this is sort of a compromise so I hope you're okay with that. I'm basically just going to go through each movie chronologically starting with Philosopher's Stone and finishing with Death Hallows Part 2, talk a little bit about what I think of each one and why I'm placing it in that tier and then hopefully that will be a springboard for discussions in the comments and things like that. The movie or movies that I put in the bottom tier aren't necessarily bad, it just means that they're the worst of the Harry Potter movies and I think that even the worst of the Harry Potter movies are above the average of all other movies if you know what I mean. And this isn't scripted so it's just off the cuff, it's just off the top of my head, my thoughts on each movie. So hopefully uh, you like this, it's a bit different to usual but um, hopefully it's fine. So to begin with, obviously we have Philosopher's Stone here, and I'm going to put that straight in B tier, straight down the middle. For me, it's the one that I've watched the most, because we had it on VHS as uh, when I was a kid, and I watched it so many times. I mean, I know this film so, so well. Uh, it's not perfect by any means. The biggest issue, I think, is the acting from the three lead characters, uh, Daniel Radcliffe, Rupert Grint, Emma Watson weren't quite there yet in terms of their acting but you know they were kids so it's it's I feel bad criticizing them that's a little bit of an issue um, for me and also the fact that not many people may know this or notice this Harry doesn't actually do any magic whilst at Hogwarts which is a big problem really if you watch the film closely Hermione does absolutely everything um, other than Ron defeating the troll Hermione just does all the major spell work and that's kind of a bit of a you know a bit of a misstep um, but the set design is amazing and that's true of the whole series but it's really great to see how good the set designs were straight from the off the soundtrack is great obviously and they get you know they get a lot of things right they adapt the book very very faithfully uh, so that's why I'm putting it in B tier so now on to the Chamber of Secrets which I have here um, I'm also rather predictably also going to put that in B tier there's less to say here because for me it's just kind of the same as Philosopher's Stone but slightly better. The acting is better, you can tell the whole film feels more sort of confident. Uh, the filmmakers obviously knew what they were doing more. There's a good bit of world building, although obviously that comes from the book, that's not really credit from the filmmakers in terms of, uh, you know, we learn about Slytherin's heritage and the found out Hogwarts and things like that. But it is kind of a repeat of the first story and I've talked about this in relation to the books as well, you know, particularly the end. It, follows quite similar story beats with going into the forest and then going below the school. It's quite similar. But yes, overall I think just a slightly better version of the first movie, but not good enough for me to put it in A tier. So next we have Prisoner of Azkaban, of course, and without question it's S tier. It's the best one, and um, it, to me that's not even... I don't even really have to think about that. It is the best one. The only major issue I have with it, and it is, it is a significant problem, is that the Marauder's backstory is really like butchered in this movie. You, you kind of learn about the fact that, you, obviously you have to learn this for the story to make sense, that, that Sirius is innocent and Peter Pettigrew is the guilty one. But you they never really bring up who created the Marauder's map, or why, or why the Whomping Willow was planted. Um, and it's obviously because Lupin was a werewolf and he needed a tunnel to get to the Shrieking Shack to hide his transformations, but never go into that. Um, you wouldn't know that the reason why Harry's Patronus is a stag is because his father was an Animagus and he transformed into a stag. That isn't brought up either. That's a bit strange. But aside from that, it's to me the perfect Potter movie. Um, it's distinctly different from the first two. And the director, Alphonse Cuaron, his, his direction is fantastic throughout this movie. Um, it feels different. There's just more sort of shots that I think that's beautiful. I love just looking at this film far more than the first two. And the soundtrack is distinctly different. There's one song on the soundtrack called uh, Window Into the Past, I think it's called. I listen to it all the time. It's really beautiful. So it, it's, I think it's the most beautiful Harry Potter movie in terms of the way it looks, in terms of the soundtrack. The acting is really good from the lead three. I mean, fantastic. It's just the perfect Potter movie. I mean, I wouldn't put it in my top 10 movies of all time or anything, which may surprise you. You may think I would, but... Um, I don't think any of the Harry Potter movies are that good, but it, it's definitely the best of the bunch, in my opinion. And now on to Goblet of Fire, which this may be slightly, you know, unpopular. I'm going to put it in C tier. 
Um, I think it's a below average Harry Potter movie. Now, if you've been watching this channel for a while, you'll know that I love the Goblet of Fire book. It's my favourite book. Actually, it's probably my favourite book of all time, which is quite a big statement, but it is. I think it's fantastic. The funny thing about this movie is I do enjoy it. I do enjoy this movie, and part of me kind of regrets that I enjoy it, because it misses so much out. And to me, the big... There's several sort of big aspects that it misses out, and they're sort of connected. Um, the first one is sort of the beginning of the story. In the book, it will take you about six hours to get to Hogwarts, okay, from the first sort of prologue chapter, it's not called a prologue, but I always kind of view it as that, uh, which is the Riddle House, through to when Harry gets to Hogwarts, it, about five, six hours, maybe something like that, in terms of how long it will take you for Harry to, to get to Hogwarts with Harry. In the movie, they're at Hogwarts after about 15 minutes, which is ridiculous, it's actually ridiculous. I mean, I, I remember going to see this at a friend's birthday party, and I would have been eight, nearly nine, um, and we went to see it at the cinema. I remember really looking forward to the Quidditch World Cup sequence. I was like, oh, this is going to be great. They're going to bring the Quidditch World Cup to, to the big screen. It's going to look sick. And Cornelius Fudge says, let the match begin. And it just cuts to the celebration of the Irish and they're back in the tent. And I'm feeling this crushing disappointment. Even as an eight-year-old, when you're sort of less aware of being sort of critical with films, I just remember feeling really disappointed. Um, and that's kind of representative of that whole beginning section of the movie, it's just so condensed and frustratingly short. Um, but I do enjoy it, and I enjoy it because the tasks, even though they're better in the book, they are fun to watch on screen. It's in their DNA, really. You can't not enjoy watching these tasks on screen. It's very, very enjoyable. I feel like I've been talking about this one for a long time, but the, just briefly, the other issue I have is the oversimplification of Barty Crouch Jr.'s backstory. It's very uh, oversimplified, and that whole section with Veritaserum in the book, where he basically gives you all the information about how he got in the situation that he is, and how he contacted Voldemort, and his plan with uh, the Dark Lord and Wormtail to bring Harry uh, to the graveyard, it, it's not there at all in the movie, and that's frustrating as well. But anyway, as I said, I've been talking about it for a while now, mainly because I love the book so much, but next, Order of the Phoenix, which, again, I'm going to get hate for this, D tier, and I get, I'll get. stress, that it doesn't mean I think it's a bad film, I just think it's the worst of the original eight Harry Potter movies. Now, I made a video about why I think this is the worst uh, Harry Potter movie, so you should probably watch that for more detail. Um, but it, the big factor is that it's the longest book, it's like 750 pages or something, depending on which edition you're looking at, obviously. Um, in terms of hours, I mean, it, the audiobook is like, what, 26 hours or something? Um, if you're reading it yourself, it'll probably take slightly less than that, but you know, so it's like it's about 24 hours to read the book, depending on your reading speed. And the movie is two hours, it's the shortest movie, not counting the Deathly Hallows part one and two, but that's different because obviously it's, it's split in two parts. Um, but yeah, it's the, it's the shortest adaptation, let's put it that way, despite the fact that the book it's adapting is the longest in the series. That does not necessarily mean that automatically it's bad, it's just what frustrates me as a book lover. It really is frustrating how much they missed out. The whole section at St. Mungo's with Lockhart and Neville's parents, like nothing, not there at all. And this is a sizable portion of the book. There must be like, what, two or three chapters um, about that sort of that Christmas period that just, and they're long chapters as well, that just aren't here at all in the movie. I also love the bit where Harry goes on a date with Cho and he gets interviewed by uh, Rita Skeeter for the Quibbler. Really interesting chapter, not here at all. Um, so they're just a few examples of things they missed out, but there's other things they missed out, like Harry's lessons. Uh, there's like the first chapter, or so there's like two or three chapters, when Harry gets to Hogwarts, and we just follow him through his lessons and through his detentions with Umbridge. Now some people may find those chapters mundane, but I really enjoy them. Uh, that ju You just get to see his day-to-day -day activity, and that's really not there either. Um, but what's the saving grace of this movie? It's probably Ivana Lynch's performance as Luna Lovegood. Every time she's on screen, it's great. So that kind of salvages the movie slightly. Um, but yeah, just the worst one for me because it misses out so much. But by no means terrible, just kind of frustrating. And of all the movies, it's probably the one that I don't really enjoy watching. I don't, as I say, I don't dislike it, but I'm not that bothered about it. Whereas Goblet of Fire, which I put in C tier, as, as flawed as it is, I still enjoy watching it. So um, there we go. Next we have... The Half-Blood Prince, which I'm also going to put in C tier with The Goblet of Fire. 
and it's a similar sort of thing. It's flawed as far as I'm concerned, but I do enjoy watching it. And I watched it quite recently actually, and one of the things that I didn't really give it credit for is that it's funny. It's a funny film. It really does make you laugh. You know, when Ron's taken a love potion, for instance, that's very funny. Uh, when Harry's under the influence of Felix Felicis, that's very funny as well. So it, it's got a lot of humorous moments in it. There are also some issues, obviously. Again, they do miss out significant things. Ginny's relationship with Harry doesn't really work on screen. Uh, the attack on the burrow, I think that happens about halfway through the movie. It's during the Christmas holidays and uh, Greyback and Bellatrix attack the burrow. It, it's completely nonsensical. It's completely nonsensical. That That's impossible. We all know that the burrow would have so many defensive spells and enchantments because it's uh, any building that's connected with the Order of the Phoenix in any way, particularly if Harry's staying there, has defensive spells and enchantments, obviously. So if Bellatrix and Greyback were able to get there so easily, then why didn't Voldemort just go to the burrow? The whole, that whole scenario doesn't make any sense. And basically it's just a, they threw in an action sequence because they were aware of the fact that the movie was quite a little bit maybe thinner on action sequences than some of the others, which is fine by the way. If you've got good characters, that's perfectly it's perfectly fine to do that. So that burrow action sequence always felt completely off to me and I, I, I still find it frustrating. And it's it's surprisingly short actually. When I rewatched it, I was like, oh wow, this is only like three minutes. It's three minutes and it's a waste of time and it doesn't make sense and it's so short you might as well not have put it in, but there we are. But it is funny. Uh, the performances, again, are great. Set design, again, is great. And it, it, it is a fun movie. It's just there are some issues with it. Um, and I think Tom Felton does a really good job uh, sort of evolving Malfoy's character. I think he does a great job with that because that was sort of, that's sort of one of the best things about the Half-Blood Prince novel is we get a more in-depth look at Malfoy and uh, I think Tom Felton, who plays Malfoy of course, uh, did a great job with that so praise to him. Next we have Deathly Hallows Part 1 which I'm going in A tier. Uh, I made a video about why this is very underrated and I think it's a fantastic movie. Not quite as good as The Prisoner of Azkaban but it is, I think it's a great film. Um, I really enjoy how character focused it is. It's obviously a lot darker and it's relatively thin on action to a certain extent. I mean, there's definitely action sequences at the beginning with sort of the break-in with the Ministry and obviously the, the Battle of the Seven Potters. And then we get more action at the end with the Malfoy Manor bit. And obviously there's a bit with Batilda, but even that's sort of more about intensity than actual action. But that, that middle section, that middle camping section is, is quite thin on action, but they do a good job with it because they keep it very character focused. And, um, the soundtrack is very good again in both Deathly Hallows Part One and Two. I think the soundtrack is excellent, um, and it's it's all around. Is the, the main reason it's so good is just because it's, they managed to make it just as interesting, if not more interesting, than a lot of the previous movies, despite the fact that there are a lot less characters. It's mainly just about Harry, Ron, and Hermione's relationship and how they cope with the task that, that that's ahead of them. And some people criticise this movie because it's a little bit more mundane. Um, but I, I think it's great, and I think it, it deserves more credit, and I think it's done very, very well. I don't have much to criticise of Deathly Hallows Part 1, not really. It's, it's, there are a few sort of, you know, contrived plot points, like Ron coming back to save Harry at the opportune moment when he's beneath the icy pool, but that's true of the book as well. That's not really a problem with the movie. Um, so yeah, a, a great film and very underrated. Which leaves, of course, Deathly Hallows Part 2, which... Again, rather controversially, I'm just going to put down the middle B tier. I, it's a really strange one for me, and I don't feel like I have much to say about it, which is odd. It, it just feels, it falls into that, this is a good ending, but I don't love it. And I, I don't know why. I don't know why I don't love it. Again, soundtrack great, as I just mentioned. Uh, probably even better than part one, actually, of the soundtrack. Snape's memories are adapted well, um, and that's my favourite chapter in the book, so I'm glad they did that well although it is, it's simplified. What's there is good, but I would like there to be more of Snape's memories. But, you know, it, it's it's pretty good overall. Alan Rickman, you know, legendary actor, does a great job at, at bringing those memories to life. Another possible issue is that the, the end fight is sort of more physical in the movies. Like, Harry and Voldemort get sort of up close and personal, which is a bit odd, a um, bit cheesy. And the way Voldemort sort of just evaporates is strange because I actually like it in the book where he has a body 
I think that's kind of more dramatic. It's like okay, Harry has to look at the 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 body of his fallen enemy, and that's I think more carries more weight to it. Whereas the movie just, as I say, just sort of evaporates, which is kind of strange. But again, the music's great during that sequence. So again, yeah, not much to say really. Other than that, I think it's a good ending that for whatever reason doesn't resonate with me like part one or like the prisoner of azkaban and i'm not sure why it just doesn't and it's also odd to put it in the same tier as the earlier movies because it's almost like oh they haven't got better which obviously isn't true that the performances have got better the soundtrack's got better as i say it just doesn't quite punch me emotionally in the way that the book does and i'm not sure why I, I, I'm not sure why it just doesn't so I'm just going purely on instinct on that one I think objectively it probably should be higher but just for me personally it's a B tier uh, Deathly Hallows part two um so there we go that's how I would tier rank the Harry Potter movies as I say this wasn't scripted this was just off the cuff um, so sorry if I stumbled or anything well, obviously I'll edit this to a certain degree um, but hopefully that that wasn't a problem. But yeah, there we go. That that's how I would rank them. If you want me to, I'll go through them a, again. Um, so in D tier, I have Order of the Phoenix. In C tier, I have Goblet of Fire and Half Blood Prince. B tier, uh, which I say is, is the average tier, average for Harry Potter movies, is Philosopher's Stone, Chamber of Secrets, Death Hallows Part Two. A tier, I have Death Hallows Part One, and S tier, I have Prison of Azkaban, which is uh, I think rather predictable, but yeah, I do think it's the best one. Please let me know how you would rank the Harry Potter movies in the comments below. That's really the point of this. Uh, it's not just to give my opinion. It's so that my opinion can be a springboard for a wider discussion. So hopefully um, people engage with that. Um, obviously I'm going to do, if this does well and people enjoy it, I'll, I'll do you know a book ranking tier video as well. Um, there's also tier rankings. You can do like characters and things. There's one that's like over a hundred characters, which I don't think I'll do because it would just get messy. But you can you can do things like that as well with these tier rankings. Um, so hopefully you enjoyed this. Thank you very much for watching, and it's goodbye from me until next time.